today, artist Jerry Wenstrom. He is here to talk to us about his experiences that led him to write this book, The Inspired Heart, An Artist's Journey of Transformation. Welcome. Thank you, Rosemary. Let me let the audience know a little about uh, your background, Jerry. Uh, in 1979, Jerry, a rising star in the New York art world, destroyed his paintings, gave away his possessions and money, and began consciously to empty himself of his identity. By letting go of resistance to whatever life would bring, he was led to the heart of the miraculous. And this is his, the book really is the story that you went through, I mean, the, the experience that you went through. Yes, it is. I mean, in a lot of ways, I, I think we all have a personal m mythos that wants to unfold, which are like the points where the real transformative moments in our life. So I, I feel like for me, writing the book was about those moments where I came up against a particular, what seemed like a limitation, and then something miraculous would happen. Something would break through to a new level of understanding. And so it's sort of a consecutive line of those events is how I best describe my book, I feel. It's, it's the personal mythos as it unfolds in relation to the larger reality. I couldn't tell in reading it, Jerry, uh, when you actually wrote it. So what year was it that you, do you, do you tell us what year you actually write it, wrote it? Um, I wrote it in 2002. I was approached by a publisher and asked to write a book, which I understand is unheard of these days, but it was, was pretty easy. I didn't know how to even turn on a computer, so I, I, I was asked if I would write a book. I said yes. I said, how soon do you want it? And she asked if I could do it in four months, so I said okay. <laughs> and I proceeded to learn how to type and use a computer, and I wrote the book. But so, now I'm curious, how did she know to come to you? I mean, what did she hear about you that she would approach you? Well, a friend was making a website for me. I had done a, an art show on Orcas Island, and this friend decided I needed a website. So in producing it, she asked me a lot of questions. And the best way I could answer them was with story. So she asked if I would write the stories. So I wrote a few stories that are similar to stories in the book, and she put them on the website. So my publisher had seen the video, which was by then by Parabola, the In the Hands of Alchemy. Parabola initially mar uh, distributed that. So she had seen that, she saw, looked me up on the website, and then read but the Jerry stories. But Jerry is talking about uh, the DVD that this is still available through. Well, it's brand new, newly out by Sentient Publications now. The, the VHS is still available with Parabola Magazine, but this is now with Sentient. In so. the hands of alchemy, the and, art and life of Jerry Wenstrom. Yeah, and there's a new film on that's not with the Parabola, which is Studio Dialogue, which is pretty much the presentation we do when we're on the road. You know, it's uh, before a live audience in my studio, Marilyn does music a lot with musicians, Thanks. live musicians. What, so what was going on in your life? And actually, we're taping September 8th, 2007, and you actually destroyed your art. It was September 9th, 1979. What actually happened to you that you would destroy your art? Well, as, as many artists, or, you know, I think if we do anything creative, you know, the studio is a kind of laboratory where you can safely experiment with inspiration and you can take risks. And so I think within the, within the safety of the studio, I was accustomed to taking risks and maybe ruining something that would have been good enough, status quo. And in taking that risk, inspiration comes through. And I feel like at you know the moment I got really good at that, and I felt like you know what a good boy am I? I can do this. I I feel like somehow the gods were saying, okay, now do it with your whole life. And and you know so I felt like mm. after fasting for a month and realizing something was changing, it wasn't that flippant an event. And fasting for a month, it became very clear that I could keep doing what I was doing, but it felt like a safe, fear-based choice, where I could follow that allurement of inspiration and trust something that guaranteed nothing, but I sensed would give me everything. 
And on the strength of that, I, I decided to trust reality and let go of my identity as an artist and just, and just give myself fully to that place of inspiration. And it proved to be the most important thing I've ever done with my life. How would you describe, Jerry, what your work was like in your 20s? I mean, because really, you're, did you start in your 20s or in your teens? I started in my teens. Well, I feel, and it's easier to talk about that early work in retrospect than it, it was then. I think I was so in it, I don't know what I was doing. But it was... Really? I mean, it was my psychological process. I would paint into my fears, and, and there was something about, you know, going into those areas and exploring that territory with, with art that would, would, I would just find liberation in it. Like, you know, and like an example would be, um, I was, you know, I, I was, um, I did a series of paintings on mental illness and, and, you know, I didn't know there was a, there was an institution in the area that had um, mentally ill people and there was something about being and, and seeing mentally ill people that felt very familiar and I think part of it scared me. So I did a series of paintings, and what I, what I, you know, I got to the mm. place where I could, you might say, you see God in those people. You see that divine mm. spark, and it made it okay. But I had to get there through the painting in a certain way. So, you know, that was the kind of pattern. Well, I'm curious, uh, how would you describe somebody who has a mental illness? What would you say? Uh, what? Because a lot, actually, if you look at your work, I mean. You really, there is a projection of, of, of something that's some agony, some. Well, the early work. Existential. For sure. your, the early work, right. And also about the struggle with duality. You know, I was doing panels, paintings, panels painted on both sides that would spin around. I was calling them angels and demons. I think it was trying to come to terms with the sort of ping pong of physicality. You know, everything has its dual counterpart. And I think we often bounce between those, good and bad, light and dark, all the things that, you know, are just always reverberating in that kind of a way. I think the, mm. w destroying the work for me was the event that brought that together. You know, in alchemy, they call it the sacred marriage, you know, the conjunctio. But there's a, you know, and, and one cannot achieve that place. It really has to come through grace. And I felt when I destroyed my art, I couldn't do any more as an artist. To, to, I couldn't do one more thing. And I feel I, hmm. my survival depended on it. I felt like if I kept doing what I was doing, I would have pushed. You know, Ramakrishna says when you, when you take a boat across the river, you don't drag it over the land with you. Art took me as far as I could go with will, intelligence, and good intention. Mm -hmm. And I had to leave it there in order to get to that place that was beyond duality. And that was a gift. You know, it, you know I don't think we can get there by way of our own will and what we think we have available. It's about trusting something larger. Well, what I thought, uh, what I found, uh, one of the many things I found interesting in, in reading your work, and uh, Jerry, is how you talk about art becoming a worship. And at that time, were you going through, were you in rebellion to the way people approached art? Was that one of your psychological struggles, would say to speak? No. So to speak? It, I, I, it wasn't that. It wasn't a reaction to that. It was more my own, it was my own need for that as an identity. I mean, I grew up in a poor, mostly black neighborhood, you know, where we were the minority being white. And so, I mean, I had nothing really going for me in life. The one thing I could do was paint. The one thing the world acknowledged in me was my, my ability as an artist. So it was the only thing I had. And so I, I latched onto it so completely as an identity. I think I needed to find out who I was separate from that identity. No. And, and so, and I felt the limitations mm -hmm. of that, saying this is who I am. It's like juggling pins, you know? It's like that's just one pin. If, if you can't handle the others, they come down on you, crashing on your head. I needed to l learn all of life. I needed to know all of life and have it all done with that kind of reverent focus and reverent attention. So ultimately, art as an identity just simply became too small for me. And I knew it, and I knew if I had stayed in it, I would have shriveled with the smallness of that container. Well, 
Well, thank you.